It's nice to see all of you tonight. Um, we're, let's see, tonight we're here to talk about the uh, first draft of the comprehensive plan, the 2018 comprehensive plan. Um, we have our consultant here, Sandrine from TPUDC, who will do most of the talking, but I just wanted to give a quick <laughs> overview and update. Yes. Town Planning and Urban Design Collaborative. Sorry, it's a long, I know. I keep trying to tell the guy who started this thing to shorten that, but. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is go through some of the highlights of the comprehensive plan, and then um, probably a 30 or 45 minute presentation, then we're gonna do a, a bunch of Q&A, so opportunity for uh, you to ask your questions. Um, one of the things that, uh, sort of kicking off to, to bear in mind with a, with a comprehensive plan, this is one of the few times where a town develops a document that isn't necessarily prescriptive. We're not getting ready to move dirt. We're not ready to sort of necessarily say, this is how much funding is gonna cost for these ideas. It's really elevating and thinking beyond today and looking at the town from sort of let's say a 30,000 foot level, and thinking about visioning what the next, the next vision for the community is. How can we sort of uh, take where we are and move uh, towards the future? And so um, that's what this plan tries to do. Um, the plan really is intended to sort of stand on the shoulders of the 2006 comprehensive plan. Um, and, and we really are attempting to articulate a lot of the difficulties um, with sort of the future land use concepts from 2006 in terms of trying to uh, uh, have growth directed to certain areas in the community that have infrastructure that are that can um, uh, that can that are situated for that while preserving other areas of the town. But then we've noticed that when we direct growth, that causes other problems. There's traffic uh, impacts, there might be natural resource impacts. So how do we balance all those things? And so that's what we're really attempting to do with this plan is to provide a policy document. It's not a prescriptive document. It identifies the issues. It gives thoughts about ways you might go about addressing those issues. But there's further conversations after a comprehensive plan is adopted that would implement regulations or implement budgetary and uh, uh, fiscal uh, elements of the community. Um, so by way of sort of kickoff, that's what I have, and I'll turn it over to Sandrine. Great, thank you. Thanks for coming, all of you. <laughs> um, as Jay mentioned, I'm gonna stand on this side for some reason, I don't know, I like this. I like the left side. Right, right for you guys. Um, so as Jay mentioned, I'm Sandrine Thibault. I am Director of Comprehensive Planning and Municipal Services for Town Planning and Urban Design Collaborative. Talk about a title, right? Um, <laughs> super long. Um, but really I've been, so I've been here. I'm excited to be back and see all of you. I, I see faces of people who were here this morning. I can't believe you guys are back for a second time. Was that that interesting? Hopefully, I don't know, um, but that's kind of cool. Um, I love the fact we've also been hearing from a few folks that have walked in during the open house or this morning that they actually have taken the document and read the whole entire thing. I'm super impressed. Congratulations to all of you <laughs> uh, for doing that. Uh, thanks. Uh, hopefully it was a good read and it was kind of interesting and we didn't put you to sleep or maybe you needed to get to sleep so that's what you read before bed, I don't know, something. Um, but anyway, I'm glad that some of you are taking the time to, to look through this because this is really the compilation of what a year, almost a year and a half, a year plus process where we've been hearing from all of you and we've been taking all of your input and all of your great work um, to write this document for you. So we're just kind of enabling and putting into pen to paper on what we've been hearing. And this process tonight, this plan has been out for a month already and available for all of you to review. We're kind of kicking, kick starting the, the, this public draft process now and you'll have until at least the end of September to take a look and provide your comments. So this is ample, ample time for all of you. And this is a draft, so 
this is here, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to know what we got right. Please do. If you like concepts and ideas in this plan, please let us know because we typically hear from folks who don't like something. But it's nice to know when you agree with something that's in the document too. So let us know that. Are we missing anything? And we already know that we have missed some stuff that we need to be adding here. So what is missing that we need to be adding? And then if, you, if there are certain things you don't agree with that, we need to know also. I'm sure many of you don't agree with a few things. And I want to make, I want to put a caveat out there. You are all different people. This community has a variety of citizens, business owners, property owners. And I will say, there is no way you will like everything that's in this plan. There is no way, and it's very unlikely, you will agree with everything. But please keep that in mind. Please keep in mind the fact that we are trying to balance the, the opinions of many, many of you. Uh, we're trying to take everything into consideration that we've been hearing and try to you know, weigh the, the pros and the cons of it all. Um, so just keep that in mind. Try to find things in there that you do agree with and that you do like. Let us know if you don't agree with something. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to have to sort of try to get a sense of what the larger community agrees on. Uh, and that's kind of our, our job, which is difficult. Yeah. I was just going to say, just a housekeeping. Oh. I'm going to send around our sign-in sheets. We want to be sure we have everyone's name and email address. Because um, as we go along, we want to be sort of on the list. So yeah, I'll let you guys know what's going on. Awesome. So my, my goal tonight is by no means to walk you through the entire document because we'd be here for a couple of days. Um, <laughs> but it's really to just tell you a little bit about the process, how the plan is organized, give you some of the highlights tonight, talk a little bit about a few of the concepts. Is my mic too close? Does it sound weird? i bring it down. Um, and, and just so give you just a sense of what's in there and just give you, get you excited to go home and kind of read it and take a look. Um, because there's a lot of material for those of you who have written, I mean, read, read the whole thing, you, you know that there's a lot in there. Anyone hasn't participated so far in this process? Who has not been to any of our events so far? Great. I'm glad we have some new faces. That's awesome. Um, anyone, uh, so the rest of you have, I guess. <laughs> I don't have to ask the question. But. Um, so just a quick reminder for those of you who haven't participated so far, uh, what is a comprehensive plan? So and Jay talked about that a little bit um, in his intro introduction um, tonight. Uh, but uh, the comprehensive plan is, it's, so it's a long range document. It's thinking 10, 20, 30. I mean, some of these things here are probably 50 years out. Um, but it's, it's sort of, let's dream big. Let's have this vision for the community and how we want Bedford to continue to evolve. Did I say Bedford? I was in Bedford last night. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is a long day. I've been up since 6 o'clock this morning. <laughs> at least I didn't say city yet. <laughs> That's going to be another one. I'll say city at some point. Sorry. Scarborough. My apologies. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I'm all red, right? Probably. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, how you want that Scarborough to um, to continue to, to evolve over time? I think we all understand that change will happen. Change change has been happening over time, right? For those of you who have been here for 20 years, Scarborough wasn't this wasn't what it is today 20 years ago. Um, so this is a wonderful process because you do get a chance to be proactive and talk as a community about how you want this change to continue to occur. And you can be proactive about it and not have to react when you, know, you have proposals coming in um, and all of that. So it's also a document that provides guidance uh, for all of your town boards and committees and the town council and, and your town staff as they make decisions um, you know, on kind of a daily basis. Uh, and it provides guidance for not only growth and development, but for con conservation also, you know, to make sure that you preserve the marsh and that you keep those wonderful open spaces and agricultural lands and forest land that you have in the community. And it contains a whole series of actions and strategies and recommendations to help you implement that vision 
that we talk about in this document that you've all articulated during this process. So the comprehensive plan really sits kind of in the middle of it all and think about it as the big umbrella uh, that then a lot of other studies and documents and your annual budget and your capital improvement plan sort of fall under. So, and your zoning regulations and subdivision regulations, all of these should follow the guidance that is set in the town comprehensive plan. And you need a comprehensive plan in order to be able to have zoning regulations in place and all that per state law. So that's something that you, that you have to have in place and update on a regular basis. So just to remind you a little bit about the process for those of you who've participated or those of you who are kind of new. So we kick-started this process back in May of 2017. Uh, I was here with my colleague Brian at the time. We had a wonderful turnout actually in this, in this exact room. And we talked about the project a little bit, what was coming, and started hearing some feedback about um, what you know, people had as aspirations, saw as challenges uh, here in Scarborough, and different issues like that. Uh, then staff had a whole series of Imagine the Future meeting also. So they went to various neighborhoods and talked to folks there as well. Again, sort of just hearing input, ideas, what people thought, and we've gathered all of that. We've been using all of that as we go along. Then in September, we were back in town with our whole entire team of consultants, and we had you know, a transportation person here, and we had uh, other planners and some designers and all of that in town. And we were here for, what, four, four and a half days, three and a half days? I can't remember how long. <laughs> it was a while back. But we had tons of different events and, and meetings on various topics like transportation and housing and, I mean, you, you name it. So that was a lot of gathering of information that we did again um, during that time. These are just some of the photos from some of the events. So that's some of the closing sessions. So these are some of the topical meetings that we had. Um, and all of that was pretty well attended. So after the Planapalooza, then a lot of your committees in town got to work. So you guys, you guys have a lot of committees. I think that was one thing that struck us when we started working in Scarborough. <laughs> so you guys have a lot of committees, which is wonderful because that means a lot of you are really involved in the community. Um, so a lot of the committees got to work and sort of prepared, you know, statements and or recommendations or various things like that that um, that they thought was important and, and ought to be included in this document as long as it kind of related to what we talk about in the comprehensive plan. So we got a lot of that information in the fall and through winter. So we gathered all of that. So that was a lot of information that we got from all of you from the different committees. And that's what we've been using to write this document uh, for you that's really based on things we've been hearing. And some of our you know, expertise also on, on a few topics, but, but mainly really on what we've been hearing from all of you. Um, and so that's why if we've missed anything, please tell us and let us know. Um, so just a reminder that this is a draft document, which means it will have more iteration, which means you have a say-so on the next iteration of this document. And this is why I'm here today. We know there are things missing that we'll be adding. We'll be adding an executive summary, which we don't have in the document right now. We'll be adding more information on the library because I don't know how, but somehow it got left out of there. Um, you know, and that always happens. I was reading a novel the other day that got published millions of copies. It's a French author from Paris. It's super well known. And I kid you not, in this Thick of a novel, I probably found myself, which I'm not a grammar person, but I probably found 50 to 60 grammar errors in there. So we have grammar issues, we know. <laughs> there will be some stuff. Hopefully we'll fix a lot of that as also as we go. And we all proofread it too. You know, Jay and Karen and myself. And, but hey, we always miss stuff like that. So we'll fix that um, too. Um, so quickly, just a little bit on how the, the document is organized. So there's an introduction. We talk a little bit about the, the public process, all those meetings and events that we've been having and how many people's attended and all that. We have a little bit on the town history, which was always kind of interesting to look back. And it was great because this morning during the presentation, 
you know, we'll talk about that drawing with the two lanes showing on Route 1 in a second. Um, I know we will. Um, <laughs> but someone said, well, it used to be that way. So it's kind of cool to look at the history to see where we came from, from a long time ago, and then where are we going from there um, into the future, too. So we have a little bit of that. The community vision is really a set of guiding principles that I'll touch on a little bit more in a minute. The state of affairs, that is sort of existing conditions. That's on population and housing and economic development and all of that. What is today? What is Scarborough today? So that's the state of affairs, that, that section. So if that's what you're interested in, go read that section. The plain framework is where we start uh, this is your future land use map. This is the, what we call the conservation and growth map. So that's where it's, we're saying these areas here ought to be conserved and preserved the way they are. Growth ought to be concentrated in these various areas. Um, so that's where we t start talking about um, these concepts a little bit. So that gets to the meat of it a little bit for me anyway. That's kind of where um, you get a little bit more interesting. The section that's called Livable and Resilient Scarborough, that's where you'll find all of these action items and strategies and recommendations that I talked to you that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's also a big piece of kind of the, the meaty stuff of how do we implement that vision that we set with the guiding principles and all those wonderful ideas on how the town can move forward. And there's a lot of stuff in there. And we'll talk about that in a second. That it's not going to all get done in, in the next five years, probably. It's longer term than that. But I would say dream big, because if you don't dream, you'll never, you know, nothing will ever happen. And I have a wonderful story I can tell you later about that if you want. Oh, sorry. And driving success is really the compilation of all those um, strategies and actions and recommendations and how they link back to your town budget and your capital improvement plan and sort of all of the work that comes that kind of follows that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so that's for people who are more like, not data driven, but because <laughs> it's not super heavy on data, but just getting down to the nitty gritty here. So I'm gonna, sorry, so I'm gonna touch on community vision, plan framework, and that livable resilience carburetor a little bit. And again, I'm not gonna go through everything because it would just take too long and what I wanna do is really hear from you mostly tonight instead of me talking at you for, for too long, but I still wanna give you some of the highlights just to give you a sense for those of you who haven't looked at the plan yet of what's in there. So let's start with the guiding principles. Um, so this is just a spread in the document. Uh, that kind of shows you this is a wonderful list of guiding principles and we really started with a lot of the policy statements that you had in the 2000, 2006 plan coupled with everything we've been hearing from all of you and then we sort of developed these guiding principles uh, based on based on all of that uh, for you guys so just to run through through them quickly so welcoming, that's ensuring that we have a wonderful quality of life for all of you living here in this community. That neighborhoods are safe and welcoming and it's kind of a healthy environment and wonderful to live here, which I'm sure you all find it already is, hopefully. Uh, but you know, improve it upon that. Stewardships talks about the preservation of that open space and the natural resources that you have in town. Think of the marsh, think of you know, any other water bodies you might have, uh, forest land, agricultural land. It's you making sure that you wanna keep and preserve that and be great stewards of that for this generation, but for future generation, for your kids and your grandkids and, and all of that as well. Um, authentic is really creating a sense of place uh, for Scarborough. That's something we, we heard a little bit from all of you that, you know, you. <laughs> It doesn't, Scarborough doesn't have an identifiable Scarborough. It doesn't have something where people come here and they're like, oh, this cool place is Scarborough. Uh, you know, often communities have a little town center that are very recognizable. Um, so creating something like that where people would be like, this is totally typical Scarborough. I mean, you guys have wonderful beaches and you have great areas of town, but uh, continuing to continuing to build on that, on that um, sense of place is important. Connection is all about building a resilient transportation system that accommodates and gives choices to all types of users. 
Uh, we all drive cars. I do. As, actually, I don't have a car, but I live in Montreal, so that's different. Um, <laughs> but I do drive. I drove here. I mean, I do drive on a regular basis still. Um, but I also bike, and I also like to walk. Um, so making sure that there are accommodations for other modes and transit too for those people who would like to take the bus. That's an interesting issue with the low density of population you have here. But anyway, connected is all about that and making sure that you have a connected street network that provides people with various opportunities to get to places and not have to go just kind of one way, which we found it acts, acts a bit, uh, increases traffic. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, healthy is uh, maintaining, again, your wonderful natural areas and beaches and public spaces that you have um, and uh, providing all of the amenities for you all to have a healthy um, sort of a healthy life so that you can recreate as you want and, and need to and make sure that there are great connections with your trail systems and all of that. Um, vibrant is all about economic development, making sure that you keep the businesses that you already have and you have a lot of wonderful, wonderful uh, enterprise here in Scarborough, you know, with the medical field and all of that, you name it. Um, so making sure that you keep these businesses here but that you also provide for opportunities for new businesses to come in because that helps your tax base, right? That helps create jobs um, and all that. So you wanna be making sure that you do that while keeping the town very attractive to everyone, including resident, um, of course. Fiscally responsible is all about maintaining a balanced budget, <laughs> making sure your taxes are staying stable. I know taxes is a sore subject here. Um, <laughs> but making sure that you're growing in a responsible and sustainable fashion so that you can keep your taxes stable, if not lower them, if that's even possible, I don't know. Um, I'm not a financial expert, but um, you get the idea. Engage is just Continuing to provide opportunities like this one for all of you to be engaged in civic life and in community life uh, in a kind of a welcoming environment uh, where you have these conversations. This is wonderful to have, and I have to say not all communities offer this kind of level of public engagement. So um, you're, you're very lucky to have that. Not everyone actually does that. So it's, it's great that you're, you're invited to be part of the conversation. And then the last one is be bold. That's kind of back to what I was saying, dream big, you know? And without dreaming, we, we never get anywhere. Um, so take proactive steps and kind of deciding what your future um, is gonna be. Um, and, and I know you guys are doing that and there are several, you know, interesting, very cool projects coming up and down the pike with Scarborough Downs and things like that where you guys have a chance to dream big and implement something really great that this community would love and that would be you know, an asset to, to all of you. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And so I'm gonna move on to the plan framework. So that's where we start talking about what I was mentioning, the conservation and growth map and identifying areas that ought to be just preserved as is. Uh, we're not gonna touch them. And then where, if there is more growth to come to Scarborough, and there likely is, because it's a desirable place to live, a lot of people want to move here, uh, where should that growth be concentrated for the most part? And this is really, if you look at the 2006 comp plan, this is really not very different <laughs> from what was in there, because you already had a wonderful foundation talking about these concentrated node of activities that you already have in place, honestly. Um, so we just continue to build upon that. Um, so just very quickly, I know this, the colors are a little difficult to see here, um, but you know, to create this map, we started with identifying, okay, everything that's water, so everything that's the marsh is gonna remain the marsh, right? And maybe even increase with sea level rise in the future. Um, and then all the greener, the, the darker green is all conservation land, conservation areas, agricultural land, forest land, land that's already in conservation easements um, that you might have, parks. Um, so all of that ought to remain open space and sort of keep as is. 
Um, and then you have the limited growth areas, which is most of the land on the west side of High 95, where you don't have, you know, for the most part, water and sewer there. Um, so growth should be pretty limited in that area also. And there are other areas also in kind of in this area that, that were already identified as limited growth and that have been for quite some time, so we're sort of keeping as is. But really, the mo the, I think the more important here is is these um, circles that you see here where you have Oak Hill and Dunstan where you already have centers of activities, right? Right here you have the schools and town hall and you have all the businesses and Hannaford and all of that. So you have already have that note of activity. Might as well continue to increase that area which is already developed and ha already has a lot of commercial on it. There's a little of, uh, there's some opportunities for some infill development there, so let's make sure that growth is concentrated in those areas. And then Scarborough Downs also is something we've heard a lot throughout the process from many, many, many of you that Scarborough Downs presents a really great opportunity for something to happen there in the future. Um, and a lot of folks in the community said that could be our new town center where we could have like a little cool village that would be mixed use where, you know, with shops on the ground floor and people living above and that kind of stuff for folks who, you know, who like that, that kind of, of environment. Um, and, you know, from my understanding of what we've been talking about is that there is actually a project kind of on the way at Scarborough Grounds. So that's exciting. I think that's exciting. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a wonderful opportunity for you guys to, to create something wonderful um, for this community. So that, these are the main areas where we're saying, you know, if there's any more development, it ought to really be focused in these three areas. And then we've also identified these little hamlets, so North Scarborough, Higgins Beach, uh, Pine Point, and, and Prouds Point, where you already have, you know, there's already a couple of restaurants, right? A couple of little stores or whatever, services. So those could be also little nodes where folks who live at Higgins Beach don't necessarily have to get in their car to go buy some milk at Hannaford's on Route 1. You could just kind of walk to the little corner store and go you know, buy a couple of things you might need and walk back home. How cool would that be, right? So nothing big there, but just a few couple of little things you know, could be kind of neat. Um, so go take a look, go study this map, and there are sort of descriptions for each of those categories, and you can read more, uh, more about that. Um, okay, so now, can I do like a big caveat? Because <laughs> I did that this morning, and then we had tons of questions on that. Okay, so in the document, and during Planapalooza, we did these planning exercises. Uh, we took Oak Hill and Dunstan, and we said, let's, Reimagine if 50 years ago things had gone a completely different route, what could have happened there? Um, so this is what I'm about to show you. These are not proposals of development. We're not going to tear any of your buildings. If you own a building in Oak Hill or Dunstan, we're not tearing anything down. We're not ripping anything down. We're not taking anyone's properties away. This is really was taking all of the principles of good planning and good development that we've talked about in the plan, because we've heard from all of you that it would be nice to have a town center where it's more walkable with mix of uses. So we said, okay, let's do an exercise and let's show you what it could have looked like if Oak Hill and Dunstan had been done differently, okay? Um, so here it is, voila. So we played around, and this is one of probably a thousand different ways it could have been done too. This was just our one option to just show you what could have been. So just to orient you, this is Route 1 here, this is Gorham's, Gorham Road. So Town Hall is right here, this is the high school, right? Um, Hannaford is right here. Um, so what this shows is what if there was a real network of streets connecting all through here and across Gorham Road where this would be, you know, more mixed use with retail restaurants on the first floor, maybe office residential on the upper floors. You could have created a little town common where you could have gathering and events and festivals or whatever that would have, you know, 
cafes or whatever that you guys can walk around. Keep the Hannaford, put the parking in the back of it. Still plenty of parking for it, but kind of hidden in the back. And then you get up north a little bit and you get into, actually that's not north, north is this way, but uh, up this <laughs> picture. And, um, and you get into some you know, townhouses and row houses type of living, and then you get into duplexes, and then you get into single family on larger lots and all of that. So you get the idea. You get from more intense kind of mixed use to more intense residential and then lower intensity residential also. Um, so again, and you know, you have some wetlands in this area. So what if you were, you know, preserving these wetlands area and just developing and making sure there are connections across. So if you know kids live on this side, they can walk to school across Durham Road easily, um, and all that kind of stuff. So again, this was just an example of if things had been done completely differently in Oak Hill from decades ago in a more walkable mixed use environment. Because we all often hear from folks in communities, and we've heard that from all of you about that. What if we had this kind of town center area? Well, everybody has a different vision and a different idea in their heads of what that means, right? So showing you this in drawings just gives you a sense of, oh, this is what they're talking. This is what it could have been. I get it now. Um, and it's really interesting because with the Scarborough Downs project that you have going on right now where you have an opportunity to cr potentially create something like this, why not take the principles and the ideas of what we're showing here that could have been in Oak Hill, but you could say, oh, we kind of like this. Let's make sure we apply that for the Scarborough Downs project and create this kind of environment. We kind of like the idea of parking in the back and bringing the buildings to the street and having great sidewalks and stuff. So, um, so I kind of like the fact that we did this exercise for you guys because then it gives you the opportunity to think about that for what's coming um, in the future. So this was just a rendering that we did. This is the view of the Hannaford considering this plan that I just showed you, and it, all of a sudden, if you do have that town common, you know, where you have little buildings and shops kind of all around it, and all of a sudden you're creating something that is completely different, that's what's there today. Um, so think about something like this for Scarborough Downs. What if you had something like that? How neat could it be, right? I, I would go there. I would come visit and, and go hang out there. Um, I think it would be pretty cool. So we did a similar exercise for Dunstan um, also. Again, this is Route 1. This is Pine Prate Road coming here. So this is the, the gas station right on this corner. This is that big existing building you have there. Uh, so similar exercise. Again, we kept the still showing sort of that older f building there. Still showing a gas station on the corner there, but we flipped it. We call it gas backwards, where we bring the convenience store portion to closer to the street, and the pumps for the gas is in the back. It's hidden with the parking. So when you're driving or walking along the street, you have a completely different experience. You see a building, not gas pumps and cars going. Um, so you go in, you know, you go in, you get your gas, gas and you can come back out um, on the other road there. So again, bringing you know, buildings closer to the street where you could have sidewalks and it could be walkable all of a sudden um, with, again, different intensity and types of housing mingled in there with some townhouses and then you get to more single family and a little bit less intense um, development. So again, just another example of if Dunstan had developed completely differently <laughs> over time. You know, and if it had been more of a walkable environment, what it could have potentially looked like. Um, so this is just a bird's eye view of that. This is Route 1. You've got Pine, um, Pine Point Road here. This is the gas station, that existing building that's there on the corner. And this is just, just a, round a rendering of that plan that I just showed you here. So that existing building is there. This is the gas backward idea where you bring the building closer to the intersection and these are your gas pumps in the back and all of a sudden you know what if the buildings were all closer to the road uh, and this could be any road in town really 
imagine if this wasn't Route 1, it was just another area of town, you know, where you would have a little node of activity like that. Um, could be pretty cool. And this is the big one. And again, Route 1 is a state road. We know that this is very unlikely to happen. But what if? <laughs> what if you were to create something different? Or what if, what if the, the two, two lane road, Route 1 would have stayed and never become a four lane road over time? Ha ha. Um, you know, where you would have parking on the street and you would have a little town common area. This is the, the existing building. This is the gas station back there with the pumps in the back so you don't see them at all. Uh, but you just get a, a, a feel for a completely different experience, completely different environment. So again, just think about this kind of idea and what you could do potentially at Scarborough, at Scarborough Downs with some of these ideas that we've presented here. All right, so we'll talk, I'm sure we'll come back to this because that's gonna be a big part of the conversation <laughs> tonight. So finally, I just wanna go through a little bit of that livable and resilient Scarborough um, section of the plan, which is where you have a lot of these action items and recommendations and all that. Again, I'm not gonna go through all of them because there's a lot, a lot of stuff in there. It's several, several pages, but I encourage you to go and take a look. To me, that's the plan framework and that is really the meat of the plan. So if you want to read just a few sections, read that. Um, that's where I would spend more, so most of my time. So we have um, some discussion about climate uh, mitigation and adaptation and energy considerations there. And I've heard already that the Conservation Commission will be sending us an addition to beef up that section, which is wonderful, I love that. Um, so this is where we talk a little bit about making sure that you consider climate sea level rise that is coming, unfortunately, um, that will definitely impact this community. So how do you make sure that as you plan for your infrastructure, continue to see new development, you take into consideration that these issues will be coming and making sure that you're building in a fashion that is going to be sustainable and resilient over time. Um, that all of that is not going to be swept away by sea level rise in the future, for example. Um, it also talks about energy efficiency in buildings, uh, making sure that your carbon footprint is a little lower, um, and that, you know, it talks about some waste initiatives, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and if we're missing anything here, let us know. Economy and job, economy and jobs is all about as I mentioned earlier, making sure that you preserve and keep the businesses you have here, but also provide opportunities and, and kind of welcome new businesses to come here. Look at, you know, business is changing, or the workplace is changing. A lot more people these days don't actually drive to the office to come back. I mean, a lot of people work from home. I work from home. I heard from someone in the room earlier who was here that said that, you know, he works from home. And a lot of multi-million dollar businesses are run from home homes from people's couches these days. So make sure you allow for home-based businesses. Um, make sure that you allow for the type of co-working spaces. You know, a lot of people are shared space, workspaces these days. So, and it could be your smaller version of that. It doesn't have to be the big metropolitan kind of model for that, but um, just making sure that these opportunities are there uh, and that you continue to support new entrepreneurs in the community. Um, and all that. So Karen, who's the SEDCO director right there, has a lot of work uh, cut out for her with all of this stuff. Thinking of the region, that's where in the plan we think a little bit and remember that you are not in isolation. This is not just Scarborough. You guys are part of a larger region. You're part of the Portland metropolitan region, and you have neighboring and adjacent communities that you um, can work with and already work with on a lot of various issues, you know, in terms of safety and emergency management and um, transportation and transit, all of that, especially transit and transportation is a great example of something that is not just local to Scarborough. I mean, it's regional, right? All the traffic you have on Route 1, a lot of that is commuters coming from, you know. So all of these issues are well and better dealt with often working with the region as a, as a group and coalition of, of communities. So that's, where we, that's what we touch on a little bit here um, in this 
uh, section of the plan. Then we, we talk a little bit about leveraging investment and fiscal sustainability. That's again, making sure that you keep a maintain, maintained a balanced budget and that you plan your capital improvements uh, for public infrastructure very well, that you protect that financial stability um, that you have in town. And um, uh, an interesting thing, and I brought this up this morning, hopefully it's <laughs> okay to mention it, but another wonderful um, kind of side project to this that the town did is that they actually had a return on investment analysis done with um, a consultant that was working with us on this, but he kind of does this side thing. So, um, and that's looking at with new development, what is that impact on the infrastructure and the services that you have in town? Um, and really understanding that and being able to analyze that more specifically. And I'm not a, an expert. Jay and Karen probably can speak more than, better than I can on this return on investment analysis, but now they have a model available here. So when, with, for example, with the Scarborough Downs project, they can kind of plug in the numbers on how many square footage of new commercial and how many new units of residential. And it will give you a lot of wonderful information about what is the impact that that will bring on your public infrastructure um, here. So that's a wonderful tool. And there was a report written for that, and I'm sure you guys will have a chance to take a look for the more geeky folks out there who want to see that. It's really geeky for me. So. Um, but that could be really interesting for some of you if you're interested. Um, available infrastructure capacity, again, that's talking about um, what needs um, to be expanded. For example, you know, expanding the public library, something we've heard a lot during this process. Uh, that there's a need for that, so we have a recommendation about that. Looking at the new, you know, safety buildings, that's already kind of underway, so check. Woohoo, you guys already implemented one of the recommendations out of this plan, that's awesome. Um, a new community center is something we've heard again and again also during this process. So these are the types of, it's more like public infrastructure, public services, uh, so there are tons of great recommendations relative to that also. Active living is all about, as I mentioned, we have a guiding principle that relates to that, right? The healthy guiding principles. So that's making sure that you have a wonderful networks of trails that are all connected where you don't have to walk on the streets. You could walk and bike through trails, through the woods and all of that, through neighborhoods, um, instead of having to get on the road if you want to. Um, also looking at and maybe analyzing your parks facilities and those public facilities that you have in town and, and making sure that you have everything that you need uh, you know, and what else is needed. So there would need to be more analysis uh, for that to, to happen. Community design and neighborhood, that is sort of getting back to those plans that I showed for Oak Hill and Dunstan. So it's, these are a series of, of um, sort of good design and good planning principles when you want to create this more walkable, mixed-use, almost like town center environment. So just things to, to think about when new development comes in, into play about you know, scale, how big buildings are and how they relate to the street and, and the design of the buildings and how, you know, how many windows do they have and is the front door in the front of the building or in the back or you know, just very basic design things which sounds silly but a lot of regulations and communities don't actually address these things very specifically. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. So that's where you'll read all about um, some of that. Arts and community um, talks about some of the visual arts and events and festivals that you guys have here as opportunities. If we need more of that, if you guys have more ideas, I think that's a section that could be beefed up too. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, Housing affordability is also something we've heard a lot, a lot during the, doc, the, the process. I remember hearing from folks uh, who live here who said that their kids have gone to college and now the kids want to come back, but they cannot afford to come and live in Scarborough. There's one, not a lot of supplies in sort of smaller units, maybe apartment types or townhouses or duplexes or whatever, um, that they can afford. So they're not able to come here and move here, which is unfortunate because you want that new blood of people, especially if they've grown up here and they want to come back in their community, 
wouldn't it be wonderful to keep them here? Um, and then as we have an aging population, and you guys are pretty old town, sorry to say, but <laughs> I mean, you know, as we all age, wouldn't you want to be able to stay within the community? If you want to get out of your house at some point and downsize, maybe you want to stay in your house and that's wonderful, but maybe you do want to downsize because you don't, the kids are gone and you'd rather stay in something that requires less maintenance, making sure that that type of housing is also available and affordable for you to stay here where you've lived for a long time. Um, so this is what this section sort of talks about and starts recommending and um, a few things along those lines here. And I think this is the last one, um, which is, pertains to transportation. You guys already have a complete streets policy here in Scarborough, which is wonderful. And that is, again, talks about trying as much as possible to accommodate multiple modes of transportation cars, bikes, pedestrians, transit, all of that. Not necessarily accommodate all modes everywhere, but where it does make sense to provide those amenities for those of you who love biking and walking. You know, we all drive, but it's nice to get out in other ways sometimes. Um, so providing a really a, a connected network of streets and providing those uh, amenities and facilities for other modes of transportation aside from the car is where we talk about that. All right. That was a lot, right? <laughs> um, I'm almost done, and then I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, so just a few quick things, just so you all know. So as I mentioned earlier, the plan, this draft, this first public draft has been out for about a month already, and it will be available uh, for another month and a half. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been announced, and it's been posted at several places. Uh, it's available for download if you guys want to read it on a computer or print it. I know the town might be, if you ask very nicely, they might print you a copy. I don't know. Um, if you rather read it on paper, but it's available in various places. There's a hard copy at the library. Uh, I'm sure you could borrow a hard copy from Jay or Karen or whoever for a little while if that's how you prefer to read it. I encourage you to go to the website scarboroughengage.org. This is kind of the project website where a lot of that um, is housed right now. And if you go there, you can download the whole document. But we also broke it down by section for you. So all the sections that I was talking about, introduction, public process, plan framework, all that, it's also broken down. So if you want to read just one piece of that, you can just download that little portion and print that or read it on your computer or whatever. And there's capabilities right there to provide your comments also. So you can do that in various ways, but I really encourage you as much as possible, if you can, if you have online capabilities, to provide your comments there. You know, one thing we've been trying to do with this process is to keep this conversation very open and not keep any information from anyone. So I love it when people comment on the website because then the next person, their neighbors, can go on the website and see their comments. And then we can start having a discussion a little bit about people's comments and people's reaction to the document. And that's very helpful for us and for staff also and for the Long Range Planning Committee who is working on this um, to just get a sense of, you know, when people comment on something, is it something that a lot of people agree with or is it just this one person that has that, you know, that gave that feedback or something. So it's, it's just really helpful. Um, so there's been um, some outreach already and there will be more. Uh, so there was the survey that was out at the library in different places. It's been online on several websites and all that. You guys have gotten f more than 500 responses, which I have to say, I know somebody commented this morning that it's not a big percentage of the population, but it's actually a really good response rate, I have to say. I've seen places where it's been nowhere near that. And I think you can definitely get some really good information out of that and start to see some good trends when you have several hundred people like that uh, responding. So we're here today with the open house. Um, so this is just one more opportunity. Staff is going to be going around in September to different neighborhoods and doing similar meetings to this one also for more opportunities for people to hear about this and give their comments and their feedback. And then this plan is also being reviewed by a lot of the town committees. So if you can attend one of the committee meetings, 
feel free to do that. They're all open to the public and you can definitely go and talk to the committee about that if it's a specific issue you have, provide your comments there um, also. And the long range um, planning committee is where all of the comments and the information is gonna sort of culminate and staff is gonna work through that with the committee and they're gonna sort of figure out what changes will ultimately be made to, to this um, public draft. So you have until the end of September to provide your comments. So I think that's plenty of time. I know m many of you have read the whole thing already, so that's awesome. Obviously, you can read it pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and again, this is the website to provide your comments online, but I know that especially on the website and the staff has set up also an email, um, if you rather just email directly, but again, I would really rather you comment via the website if you can. Or you can certainly, you know, write stuff down and just walk it in here if you don't have computers or whatever. We're happy to take comments in any way and we'll, we'll make it work. Um, and this is kind of what I was mentioning a little bit. So the, the, all the different committees are going to be sending their comments and taking all of your comments and sending all of that to the long range planning committee. Um, and so they're doing their review and all that through fall. Um, then we're going to make changes to this draft. We're going to bring back a, a final draft. It's still a draft, but it's going to be what we call a final draft um, to all of you guys. And then that's going to start going through the actual sort of official review and approval and adoption process with the planning board and the town council. And there will be more opportunities again for you to participate and give feedback. But hopefully by then we'll have it right because you guys will all tell us what you think now, right? And we'll make changes and you're all going to love the plan and this thing's going to be adopted, right? Um, <laughs> so that's just the gist of it. So just a few things. So remember that we want to hear what you like about it. Please do tell us if you like certain ideas in there, concepts, recommendations, and you're like, woohoo, I love this. Tell us, let us know. Um, anything missing? We know we've missed some stuff. So what's missing in there? It's, sometimes it's harder to figure that out because it's missing. <laughs> but I'm sure some of you will think of some stuff. And then um, if you don't agree with something, tell us. We need to know also. All right? And that's it for me. Mic drop. Um, so we and I'm going to... Open it up. Go ahead. So we're going to open it up. We do have a microphone that um, we're hopeful people will speak into because we are recording the meeting. So and we'll play this on cable TV so people can hear the comments and um, and the responses. So Karen Martin, the SEGCO director, has been mentioned a few times tonight. Is going to be scribing some comments, and I'll be writing down some notes as well. And uh, so and we have like the taping, so we can yeah, listen yeah, back yeah, to yeah, it. <laughs> Which is great. What exactly is the Scarborough Downs project and what is its status at this point? How does it relate to the plan? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let one of these two talk about that because that's sort of ongoing. And <laughs> Hi. So the Scarborough Downs uh, was sold uh, in early this year, in January. And so it was sold to the, um, uh, the Rosbera and the Mishos, it was a, a new, new partnership that was developed. So they are local uh, business owners and they uh, live here as well. So they bought the downs and have been working toward um, really uh, designing a master plan for the entire area. And w the planning board has been working through um, really the infrastructure master plan at this point. Correct, Jay? Yes, so they have a, an approval for the infrastructure plan and now they're working uh, through different pods, different phases of development. So their first pod is at the planning board. And then last night to the council, there was a workshop. And they talked about the entire uh, proposal, you know, what they're really planning on doing. And they are planning on doing several of the types of things that have been described here. It's a mixed use um, project. It has housing. It has um, industrial, uh, light industrial, it has office, it has retail. So it's really a, a fairly comprehensive uh, set of uses. And it's about, the whole parcel is 500 acres. Um, so it's really a, a significant parcel and it's gonna be built out over a 20 to 30 year time frame. Cool. So 
Yeah. And it, can people find out more information? Is it on sure, the website? Sure. There, um, the, there was a present. Well, there's several places. Um, all of the planning board um, material where they where they've been to planning board. That's um, on the website. I always think the easiest way to get to it is to just do a search at the top um, of the page, and you'll get planning board minutes and all of that. Um, last night's presentation is on um, the home page right now, so you can go through and see that presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, the home page uh, for uh, the town of Scarborough, so scarboroughmaine.org. And I think it went out on, I think that was pushed out on Facebook today too, as well, for those of you who are Facebook fans. Facebook friends. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Susan Thompson, Higgins Beach. My concern is about stewardship. Scarborough doesn't have uh, sewer systems throughout, so many of the homes that are built on the marsh in Scarborough near me have septic tanks that are over 60 years old. I bought a house with one. There is no test. There's nothing from the town to keep these up to date, so I know of three of these failed systems and that sewage is going right into the marsh. Mine was too. We had to re Ooh. replace ours, not by a mandate of the town, but because we didn't want all that stuff in our backyard. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that if we're interested in the infrastructure and in preserving our environment, that should be in this plan, is doing something about the sewage. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great point. On that same note, we have a severe erosion problem at Higgins Beach and I think it's pipeline as well. We have a severe erosion problem at Higgins Beach as well as Ferry Beach and as well as Pine Point. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that is occurring within your talk, there's no plan because what happens at Higgins Beach, we have our infrastructure on Bayview and we need to be sure, it plays on what Susan was saying, that we need some sort of plan as to how do, how do you propose to protect that that infra infrastructure, which, which includes sewer and water, and is about maybe, it ha it set, it, during the storm we had last year, it was about 20 feet from the sewer line. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, the sewer line is under about, maybe about four or five feet beneath the soil, yeah. but it is an issue, and there's nothing in your plan that even talks about these things. Mm -hmm. so, so these types of issues are not typically addressed in a comprehensive plan. They would be more in-depth studies that would be done you know, by the town sort of as a separate effort. Um, so it's, it's... But, but this thing, this affects the, the, the whole entire community in terms of Higgins Beach. Mm -hmm. A lot of the property owners depend on rentals for income so they can pay the taxes. And if the infrastructure goes, everything goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we could wait and, uh, to a later date. It has to be part of a, infra, uh, part of a plan now. Jay, I don't know if you have anything to say. I mean, we can definitely speak in general terms about the need to, you know, to address, sept, you know, folks who are not on, on, sept, sept, run on septic tanks if they're leaking and all that. But they're, as part of this effort, there's definitely, you know, will not be sort of in-depth analysis of, of what to do with a particular pipe over there and a particular pipe over here. Um, that would be a separate effort. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, getting back to your, I think you indicated that you based a lot of your plan on uh, feedback from people um, from last September and so forth, people mm -hmm. that you interacted with. Yeah. Uh, and my question is regarding the hamlets and specifically Higgins Beach. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you have people come up to you and say that they needed more restaurants or more uh, corner stores or whatever in the Higgins Beach quarter mile that you have in that circle? Um, or was that just something you thought might be nice? Because we do have a market there. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the market has all kinds of, it's like a little restaurant, ice cream shop, uh, corner store, all wrapped in one. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just curious if anyone felt the need for more. 
No, I don't know that anyone talked about the need for more. I think these hamlets actually are um, heritage of the 20, 2006 plans that identified several little, they were called villages, I think, in the 2006 plan. And, you know, North Scarborough was one, Higgins Beach was one, um, and all of that, that already have this kind of little note of services and maybe one little store and a couple of little restaurants. Yeah. Um, we haven't heard specifically necessarily people saying we need a second little store, uh, but it's just to make sure that, that we preserve that and allow that to mm -hmm. continue, uh, especially if it is a wonderful well, Mike, amenity I, for I all of you. I was worried about increasing the zoning so you could add more stores, and then what would that do? Because the population after Labor Day plummets. Mm -hmm. And so if you add another little corner store or even a little seasonal restaurant, you're going to... They, there's not enough business for it, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. So sure. I think we have enough for, for the little population. Yeah, I think it was more in terms of being able to keep what's there and making sure it, okay. it can continue, right. um, well, if we can continue to happen. That, that would be good. And, and just kind of identifying the fact that it's there already. Uh, and I, I mean, I would have to reread the description of the hamlet, but I'm not, I don't think that we're saying well, it was, do it all was this saying stuff. A, a, within a quarter mile of the circle, um, the circle would, that could be rezoned in that actually. Mm -hmm. What is the zoning there now, Jay, do you know? It's either R4 or residential depending on, there are no other businesses there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just homes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? I'm cold, I'm gonna grab my jacket. Sandrine, on the uh, slide you showed of the what uh, Oak Hill might be, you know, the vision uh, could have it, been, uh, and the <laughs> and the and the gas backwards concept. Yeah. You showed uh, the Hannaford, and then Hannaford uh, with a town center or green space. Uh -huh. In that type of a situation, what happens to the parking for Hannaford? What, what it's in the back of the building. So they would have to change everything and, and reorient the store. It could have been done differently to begin with. Okay, I, you know, and, and, and where you've seen this gas backwards concept implemented in, I assume, other, other areas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just taking a look on, on the plan or the, the pictures, do you create a, like a valley of uh, you're going down the street and then all of a sudden the buildings are, are much closer to the road than they presently are? Uh, I mean, how, how does that look? You create the valve, you put the gas tanks to the rear mm -hmm. or parking to the rear, but that really narrows, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the sense of passing through. But uh, I, I'm just curious as to how that works in other areas. Yeah, so s communities around the countries have been kind of implementing these types of, you know, more walkable and bringing buildings closer to the street and all that. And it does several things. It one is more welcoming for the pedestrians because all of a sudden you're walking along a slower, slower, it slows traffic down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you add, when you take a road and you add on street parking, all of a sudden you're slowing traffic down. So it slows traffic down. It creates a, a, a more inviting environment for the pedestrian. Think about it. When you go, I'm sure you all go downtown Portland, right, sometimes. You go walk around. And why is it great to walk around there? Because you have a wide sidewalk, and right next to you are shops and coffee, you know, and you, you can see through and you see in the coffee shops and in the restaurants and in the stores, right? You have the retail on the first floor there, and often there's on street parking. So for communities who want to create kind of this, um, this environment, bringing the buildings closer to the street, hiding the parking in the back really helps you create that more inviting walkable environment and kind of town center or downtown feel, um, if you you know if you want to think about it, and putting on street parking really slows down traffic. I mean, some communities, you know, would say as a community, if your desire is to slow traffic down, to make sure that people stop at businesses. Right now, most people are driving on Route One; they're not stopping in, in Scarborough to spend any money. I can t I can assure you that maybe they're stopping once in a while to get ice cream or donut or whatever at the wonderful donut shop that you guys have. <laughs> um, 
But you know, most of the time, they're just commuting in and out, right? They're not stopping here. So if you want to capture some of that by creating an environment like that, all of a sudden, people kind of have to go slower. And all of a sudden, they're seeing stuff. And they might you know, be more likely to, to step by. Um, but again, it was just kind of a, a concept idea of, of what could have been if it had been done um, differently. And just an example of the parking in the back and all that, I was actually, I know it's a completely different environment. I get it. I was in Washington, DC the other day. I know Washington, DC is not Scarborough. Um, but it was wonderful because I was driving down the road and at some point I was like, that's a Walmart. And it was a Walmart, I'm not kidding you, that was up to the street, right on the sidewalk, big Walmart sign, wonderful architecture building, not the Walmarts you see anywhere else. Parking was hidden in the back of the building in a two-story two parking garage back there. And I was like, huh, they can do that too. You know, how cool was that? And it fit really well within the fabric. Of course, it's Washington, D.C., and it's very different, different density of population and all of that. But it, it, it was just an example of how they did something completely different, and they continued sort of the same feel of all the other buildings. And it was just about two-story high. It was nothing, you know, crazy. But um, all of a sudden, you could walk along, and you could see in the store, and it was just... There's really a, cool. there's a development in Portland as you come off the, uh, uh, the Casco Bay Bridge and you come to the, uh, maybe the first set of lights and it's on York Street and it used to be a couple of buildings set back and the developer took those down and built right out to the street mm -hmm. and narrowed it and frankly it's ugly and it doesn't, you know, it, it gives you a very, very different feel for that area. Mm -hmm. It's not in a commercial uh, area like it, like the old port or something, but it's it's not very attractive. Uh, is know, it when, when is it the architecture of the building that's oh, not attractive? It's, I think it's both. Uh, you know, it's right out to the right out to the road, and and you know it has a sidewalk, but I you know I for one don't find it very attractive mm -hmm. in, in that type of setting. Mm -hmm. One one other comment I, I'd like to make is, uh, you know, you've heard about the hamlets, uh, yeah. so so called, and. I think, and I'm talking about Pine Point, I think there's a, a future issue or it's coming as to uh, the conflict between uh, you know, traffic and parking. Uh, I'm sure it, it's there in Higgins Beach also, but in Pine Point and uh, you know, what, what's gonna be, uh, be the long range plan you know, for those areas. And it's not really, you know, really addressed in uh, I, I mean, I really haven't read the plan, uh, the draft plan very uh, uh, closely, but most of what I see around, uh, uh, you know, for Pine Point is a picture, an aerial photo saying, you know, this area is, is dangerous because of sea level rise or the slog recommendations, which, uh, you know, that, that's about it. But f for livability aspects of, uh, in those hamlets is the, the amount of traffic uh, in there, uh, kind of the, the controlling of it, uh, the parking versus uh, the conflict with, with uh, bike riding and parking. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think maybe some look at uh, what might the conflicts be uh, as, you know, going down the road for, for these hamlets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Great. So are you saying that we shouldn't call that a hamlet? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Hi. Um, it, it's apparent that uh, the Scarborough Downs project is going to be a big part of our future, and uh, and I love the idea of the uh, the uh, center of town concept. Um, is there that being the case? Is and it's going to be a major development, and and we talk about uh, creating a model community, Scarborough setting standards, being a model for other communities, and within it. The Downs project would obviously play a big role. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, 
Is there any planning at this point in time, uh, any kind of energy plan for it uh, that uh, you know will see to it that it has a uh, 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 an energy plan that uh, designs in lots of um, renewable energy, for instance, uh, solar orientation, or is this uh, um, um, infrastructure plan already laid out with square grids that don't take solar in infrastructure uh, orientation into consideration, thereby radically re reducing the amount of uh, renewable capacity that the community would have? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you guys try to address that. some of that. Um, so, just to relate back to the comprehensive plan, doesn't lay anything out specifically for the downs. Um, I think where the comprehensive plan could talk about those type of elements is is that a, a, a direction the town wants to go? And I think that's where we've asked you know our, our friends at the energy committee, conservation committee, to to review. Uh, the provisions and, and statements that are in here, and, and are we setting the right policy direction? That's what the comp plan is going to do. It's not going to tell the downs what to do. It's going to help us set the policy direction. Now, I can try to answer some of the downs question by saying um, I haven't, um, there really hasn't been much discussion about solar orientation specifically, um, but that doesn't mean that's not part of the plan. That's not just one of the town's regulatory standards at this point. Mm -hmm. But I do think, again, what I'd like to circle back to is that the comprehensive plan is the document that would plant the seed that would say, you know, this is something we should care about. And then we all ag agree or disagree, talk about it, get it in the comprehensive plan. Then there's future conversation about what does that mean and what does that look like exactly in terms of regulatory discussion. Mm -hmm. I think it's very similar to maybe the discussion we're just having with regards to scaling and massing. When we talk about buildings close to the street and oriented to the street. Does that mean six-story buildings right on the sidewalk? Or does it mean two-story buildings, 15, 20, 30 feet set back from the road? So it's about scaling and massing and sort of taking the, the general concepts, the, the design parameters and policies that are laid out in the comp plan, and then uh, establishing with, through further conversation and, and more rigorous debate around what do the details mean. Um, mm -hmm. So I hope that helps in a couple of different ways. Um, I'm going to come right here. I promised you, and I almost forgot. Well, I don't know whether anyone can answer this question or not, but I was just wondering. Apparently, the last comp plan was in 2006, so we're doing one now 12 years later. Um, I guess the question is, why now? And I was just wondering, how have we done with the last one, and what was left over to do that might still be helpful. That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> I can tell you that they're updating it now per state statute. The state requires municipalities to update their comp plans every 12 years. Kind of have to do it. Um, and as far as what was implemented from the last one, I'm going to turn it back to Jay for that one because he probably is much more familiar than, he, than I am. Well, I'm that. not sure I can walk through <laughs> everything that was implemented. Um, yeah. But I do what I would, what I would say is so. Um, the 2006 comprehensive plan, one of the things we talked about when we needed to update the comp plan was how the 2006 plan um, really still resonates with the community. It sort of set forward, set forth sort of the, uh, the growth districts and uh, lower to moderate density growth areas and the conservation areas of the community. And that over the last uh, 10 years or so, the town has really updated much of its zoning standards um, to uh, try to promote that type of development. And so um, where the zoning was be being implemented over all that time, development hasn't quite caught up. So we haven't seen the articulation of what that zoning looks like, but the concepts um, are, are there. And I think what this plan is aimed to do is stand on the shoulders of that plan and then to build off and sort of um, provide further direction in terms of um, issues around energy c consumption, climate uh, adaptation, uh, traffic issues, which were raised in the 2006 plan and in this plan. And if I had to guess, they'll be raised in the 2030 <laughs> plan. Um, but we uh, will certainly keep endeavoring to do our best. Was there, I'm just going to go to New Voice and then we'll circle back. I just wanted to give uh, um, 
locals of an example of a, a gas backward project, and that would be the uh, Irving gas station in South Portland, the reuse of the armory project. They uh, created the gas station at the back of the armory, put the green space at the front with picnic benches and areas to sit for the people who are buying food at the cafe inside the mm -hmm. gas station. It's a lovely setup. It also is a calming influence. It's a, an incredibly busy intersection there. And the way they created the open plaza at the front is a really great uh, gift to the eyes. And, and trying to um, determine where you go with traffic in that area is really chaotic. And so again, the, just that moment of respite in front of the armory was a, was a really great project. So. Uh, that's a gas backwards. It's an Irving. I'm gonna look. It's it an up Irving on gas station. Google they Earth. reused a, a National Guard armory uh, and put the ar the gas station at the back, and the armory space is upstairs is a commercial enterprise, and then the first floor is a, a cafe. Um, Wonderful. Quick quick mark kind so of setup. So go, go take. I, I hate to tell you to drive to add more <laughs> cars on the road, but go take a look <laughs> when you get a chance. <laughs> Um, I, I have uh, actually read through the whole plan, and I think that the great strength of the plan is that it's, it is very readable. Um, you can get through it, and it's got pictures, and um, however, uh, the cover has got to go. Um, having the bait I shed love on that there, photo. That's um, a great lunch place. I'm sorry, it there. may be a great place to eat, but in terms of what, what that is doing to the neighborhood, um, down in Pine Point, the, the, the amount of traffic that there's a couple of new places that are open longer and um, right across the street, the house came up for sale, two houses away has come up for sale. It is, um, it is really changing the character of the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. we're not all, I mean, I, I love to eat there. I like the food, but um, <laughs> uh, not really, you know, I don't live next door to it. Mm -hmm. um, I am very worried about um, how the 2006 plan was very specific. It was very detailed. It, um, there were policy recommendations that were like A13, B13, you know, I mean, it was so detailed. Um, and then there were um, implementation, there was a timetable. There was an implementation plan that, that um, was very specific about zoning that needed to be changed. And the town took it step by step and implemented a lot of the, the zoning changes. So I, it's unclear to me. Um, a lot of these objectives are very um, general to make something more walkable or more sustainable or, or more energy efficient. It's not specific enough uh, and who's responsible for doing that? Uh, I mean, it's really hard to see how this plan will get implemented. Um, so, I, I, for example, with uh, the gas backwards or having development right up against the street, are we, is the town actually thinking at this point of any new development that's coming in on Route 1, um, it will mandate that the building will need to be right at the street and the parking will be in back. Um, are we getting to that point that we will start thinking about that? And I mean, how is that gonna be implemented? How is this, this plan gonna be implemented? Because these plans, comprehensive plans are important and um, they do get, they get used um, as a legal defense for a town. Um, to be able to, if they're challenged on something, a decision that they've made, um, and how something either goes against the comprehensive plan or it's, and it's really hard for me to understand how this plan, the way it's written now, could be used. Because you could do almost anything and say that you're complying with the comprehensive plan. Um, because maybe it did make something more walkable, or maybe it did, it, it's just, it's so general that um, it's, anyway, that's mm -hmm. my concern. Okay, thank you. I think that was, um, <laughs> that's interesting that you comment on that because I think that was actually part of the discussion at the beginning of this process that um, 
you know, the town wanted a document that was more as aspirational and, and a little less dense in terms of all the, that detail that was in there. And looking at the 06 comp plan, when I see things like there ought to be, you know, 40 units per acre in this particular area, to me that is zoning. That is not comprehensive plan. Um, these are the types of actual standards that you have in your subdivision regulations and zoning regulations. Um, so I was actually surprised to see that in the 2006 comp plan. I think that gets a little too nitty gritty in the detail. That's the kind of stuff that you want to do after. That being said, I think you do bring a good point and there might be opportunities for a little bit more specificity and maybe when we talk, for example, about things like making areas more walkable or whatever, maybe we ought to specify where and what do we mean. I don't think that we mean everywhere along Route 1. I think what we mean is those community activity centers that we've identified like Oak Hill and Dunstan and probably Scarborough Grounds also as very, you know, kind of specific where there are to be and there could be some little infill opportunities in, in the existing areas and where Scarborough Downs could be done in a completely um, different way. So I think that's a good point and we ought to probably look at the document and see and maybe identify areas where we can be a little bit more specific about some of those. Uh, so help us identify where. Um, I think that would be, that'd be very helpful. I'd like to agree with that comment. I think that the comprehensive plan is very vague. And um, to touch on uh, Higgins Beach as the model for the character code, um, it's pointed out in the comprehensive, in the draft quite a bit that it's kind of the model that could be the zoning for the rest of the town. Mm -hmm. So um, with the Higgins Beach character code, uh, it's primarily a residential area. It previously was zoned as R4. There were um, uh, some businesses there that were uh, residential with commercial use, and they were rezoned as mixed use. And the potential uses were expanded, and um, so they're subject to site plan review. That was added, um, you know, in the first phase of this. But um, so my, one, of, one of my questions is in looking at Higgins Beach or Pine Point or Prout's Neck as a hamlet or even looking at some of the residential areas is the idea to take the same approach. So um, say in Prout's Neck, what comes to mind is the Black Point Inn, but I think the association owns that. Is there going to be... Uh, are those areas going to be rezoned to incorporate mixed use as well? So there is a consistency throughout the town. I didn't say that. At Jay. I thought you had more. Yeah, and, and will the commercial businesses in these primarily residential areas that you know have traffic issues already be further developed to? Um, make them more commercial where maybe that's not so appropriate. So I guess what I would say to that is, is that would be part of a, a, a conversation that occurs, um, much like when uh, the rezoning at Higgins Beach occurred. There was a uh, very much a, a, a uh, um, concerted effort by the Long Range Planning Committee to reach out to the community, get initial feedback, sort of run that through the hopper, so to speak, bring that feedback back to the community. So I would say before anything like that were to occur in any of the other hamlets or any other district of any type, type that, that, that's typically the, the process mm -hmm. we use. And, and I think, again, with the hamlets, it was, it was kind of a heritage from the 2006 plan where you have, uh, we've identified these villages in the 06 plan. So we, that's why we're just calling them hamlets now and not villages. Um, if, if we ought to change the narrative about the hamlets, if you don't want to see anything else happen there, tell us and we'll, you know, we'll change that. If overwhelmingly everybody's like, uh-uh, don't do anything else, you know. And, we'll, and I, would, I would just add to, to Jay's point, very good point, in that uh, when the Higgins Beach zoning was amended, mm -hmm. 
And there was conversation about whether or not the market was actually in Higgins Beach any longer. And it was, it was you know, again, it goes back to the, perhaps the plan is too vague because the response was that it was consistent, it's consistent with a comprehensive plan. So if the comprehensive plan is, you know, wanting to encourage commercial business and that becomes the answer if, you know, as the zoning gets developed, it's, you know, of concern, then, so I would agree that perhaps the comprehensive plan needs to be a little bit more specific so there's a clear understanding of what it is before it gets approved and then becomes the Bible for future zoning and development. Okay. So what I would ask of you then is be specific in your comments um, back to us. So if you think there's specificity that needs to be added in language, let's say, relative to the Hamlet, let us know exactly what you mean. Don't just say it needs to be more specific because we have no idea in what way you mean it needs to be more specific. So really tell us what you think it ought to, it ought to say or, and, and sort of talk about. That will be very helpful as we review comments that we're getting and, and thinking of the changes to make to the next draft of the document. I think if you were to survey Higgins Beach, 99% of the people do not want business expansion mm -hmm. or a little market or anything else. They can drive to Hannaford, and that's why they're there. Because More driving, though. It's oh. private. Too bad. <laughs> That's what they bought. Don't here. complain about traffic then. No, uh huh. No, I don't want to hear not. it. <laughs> but I think if you did a survey, and I probably a proud snack and pine point are the same. We're not looking for a grocery store. We're not looking for Radley's Market to land on it. Great. Thank you. Anyone else we haven't heard from yet? We're coming up on eight o'clock, but I'm happy to stay as long as you want. Although I have a two-hour drive, but. Just saying. Huh? No rush. <laughs> so I just had a couple of specific questions. Uh, the first one was you mentioned 500 responses. Um, was that to the, so the survey, survey that had gone out this that summer? Was just has, out. has that been incorporated into this draft, or is that intended to be uh, in, incorporated as we move forward? So this, the survey was really kind of testing a lot of the ideas that are in the, in the comprehensive plan, right? So I think we just closed the survey. Yep, so yesterday. Yep, we just closed the survey. So as Sandrine said, it really was to sort of test some of these policies that we had seen sort of in the early drafts to say, okay, you know, we heard it. We think we heard it, I should say. Let's test it. So um, we um, have not yet sort of pulled that information together. It did just close yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be working with the, you know, we'll be pulling that material together. We'll make that available, working with the Long Range Planning Committee to say, all right, here's what we're hearing. Are we we're still on the right track, and I know yeah. you've had others, so. I'll so we'll, we'll use the results for the next go around. That's great. Yeah. And then uh, my next one is very specific. Uh, on a slide, you said, contemplate a Scarborough BID, and I just don't know what that means. Business Improvement District. That's, well, Karen can probably explain it better. Not <laughs> you left it in there. Though. So I think as Sandrine. <laughs> But it's, it, but it, but you know, that's the idea of businesses coming together, um, and sometimes, you know, some communities have business improvement district uh, where businesses pay a small fee or something like that, and that is then being used for some improvements in that area that just kind of enhances and, and makes it more attractive and sort of welcomes people and kind of has a tendency of bringing more people and other and I think that was specific. I think initiatives here. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it wasn't for the whole. Right, but that's also obviously if businesses are interested, if there's a benefit to it. So it is eight o'clock, um, and as Sandrine said, we're happy to stay and answer questions as we go. But I don't want f people to feel like they're being rude if they need to leave. <laughs> I know a few <laughs> folks have already gone off, and that's okay. But we are happy to <laughs> keep answering uh, any questions. So. Uh, Anyone, anyone else? In the back, great. All right. I knew yeah, I'd feel, get someone. Feel free to leave if you want to, um, but I'm happy to stay and chat a little bit longer. Jay, what's our, what, what's our email? What's the bank email? Thank you, you for coming. 2018 comprehensive plan at scarboroughmaine.org. If you go to any of the, our websites, if you go to the website, you it's there. <laughs>
Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is Paul Letardo. I live down on the Black Point Road. And a uh, few th thoughts and comments. First of all, I think you guys have done a tremendous amount of work here. And uh, it's very thorough, uh, and it's a great uh, piece of community engagement, too. So kudos to all of you who were involved Thank in you. that. Um, the other couple of pieces that I'd like to just comment on is um, your movement towards, um, you know, sort of a new urbanism development of the town, I think, is, should be commended. I think it's a great way to go. Personally, my, asp my approach to this, I'd rather see a well-designed building than a parking lot any day. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, there's just far more benefits. It gives you the opportunity for better landscaping. Uh, and I also think that uh, a lot of the comments that are made really should be dealt with with more thorough revamping of zoning ordinances in the way the languages uh, of our zoning ordinances are written. Uh, I think that you know we need to have an opportunity to do good things here in this town, and uh, but that needs to fall within the guidelines of a well thought through zoning <coughs> ordinance and a process too. I think the process could be improved. Uh, you know, for instance. Um, uh, I've, I've been watching some developments evolve over time, mm -hmm. and the notification to the neighbors, that needs to be a broader-based communication piece. It shouldn't be immediate neighbors. It should be neighbors within a 1,000 feet, because these, these larger developments impact a community that's broader than just the abutters, mm -hmm. and I think that that needs to be taken care of. Yeah. Um, the other last piece that I just wanted to talk about is uh, we've talked about sustainability, and I think it, there's some great things here. I, I'm all for walking, you know. Uh, I think it's a great way to go. Um, as a landowner, I have a fair amount of my land in agricultural use right now, and I think there ought to be some thought given toward better incentives to preserve agricultural land beyond just a uh, property tax break. You know, there's all sorts of incentives to develop property, but mm -hmm. what are the incentives that a community versus a state or a federal agency mm -hmm. can provide to help preserve yeah. uh, farm-based land? You know, it's, I'll tell you, it's challenging to have to pay the taxes on land that may be producing hay. You know, yeah. there's not a big return there, um, particularly when you've got all the utilities, gas, water, and sewer right there. So there's, there's big pressure on landowners to have to sell their land. So when we're doing an analysis of payback, that becomes a challenge. What is the payback of preserving open land, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody loves it when they drive by and look at a great hay field, but nobody puts money in the bin out in front of the driveway. <laughs> so uh, That's a good point. <laughs> there's a piece to that that, I, that I'd like to preserve. Yeah. And uh, going along with that, the other um, important reason to do that is whenever you look and have looked at or read books and studied uh, sustainable site development, the worst place from a sustainability standpoint to put a development is on farmland. Mm -hmm. It takes food production out of our communities. And uh, that's what's left. There's a lot of great farmland. Mm -hmm. So hopefully something like that, along with better language in the zoning ordinance, uh, can be worked into this program in some, mm -hmm. some form or fashion. Yeah, those are great points. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, and that's really interesting, too. And I think that's why you probably see in the plan, you know, a lot of the talk about creating a little bit more intensity in certain areas of the community, because do, by doing that, you are helping in a way to preserve the open space and the agricultural land that you have, because there's so much development pressure on a lot of that, and you do want to keep some of that, right? And I'm sure you all love that and <laughs> you don't want to see every little square inch of this area developed in sub whoops sorry in subdivision uh in re you know residential subdivisions everywhere so concentrating and having a little bit more intensity in oak hill and dunston and scarborough downs and all that allows you to bring people in here while preserving some of that but thank you for your comment also about thinking about some incentive for to you know to help preserve that open space and conservation and agricultural land over time. So we'll definitely keep that one in mind. Thank you. Anyone else? I just, I would like to just make the point that um, I did a pretty detailed 
um, analysis or had a lot of comments. And I looked at the website. I didn't, I couldn't figure out where to send it. So I sent, I sent it to Jay. And I think that um, just as you had a banner on the home page um, saying that there's a survey available, you know, okay, got it. It would be, it I think you got to get the word out to people that if they want to make comments, um, there is a capability now that I just looked for it and I could, now I see where I could have, with each section I could have added my comments yep. right there. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wasn't aware of that and I'm. So you're saying putting on the town website? On the town website or, mm -hmm. or s s figure out a way mm -hmm. to, to at least get the word out that um, here's where it is because I couldn't find it and okay. I was looking. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Thank you. We'll make sure that we make it that clearer for folks. If you go to the scarboroughengage.org website, you'll see different tiles on the home page and one that, that says public draft. Click on that and that will bring you to the page. And then if you scroll down, you'll see all the different sections of the document, introduction, public process and all that. And there's a, you can comment right there. Uh, so that's where you should go. But yeah, we'll make that more clear. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, all right. everybody. Thank you all for coming. Make sure you take a look, and please, again, provide us your comments, positive, negative. We want to hear it all. All right? Thank you so much. Have a good night. Yay!